Welcome to Creativity and Robots, and we're on episode number three already. I have a very special guest. We're chatting with Natalia Iragori. She's a superstar brand builder who helps companies build the story from the inside out and with the right people. Today, we're diving into her expertise to find out how she builds teams, how she uses AI to shake things up in marketing, and her thoughts on where digital marketing is headed. So without further ado, let's dive into the conversation. How are you doing, Nat? Hi, Juan. Thank you for having me today. Nat, just to dive in on your background, what led you to specialize on marketing? Juan, I think that's a, that's a big question for me because I didn't actually do any of that for my undergrad. I studied industrial design. Um, and when I graduated industrial design in Colombia, there wasn't a lot to be done. So I knew that there was a part of me or a part of the things that I had done that was really interesting, which was strategy and advertising kind of seemed to be the place for that. And that, that made me fall into or get closer to marketing as a whole. Um, so I started out doing I want to say, you know, all of the dirty intern work of like uh, looking at copywriting, making sure the writing was right, getting everybody's paperwork ready for submitting for awards, things like that. Um, and then just trying to inch a little bit closer to the people who did strategy. Um, and that was not well taken, actually, <laughs> because you know that your roles in advertising are always like very specific. So you're either on the creative team or you're on the on the account team, but you don't really do the in-between. Um and that was the thing for me, where I wanted to be a little bit of everything, but I didn't want to be in just one department. Um, All right. And uh, let's dive into that, you know, because you said you're either a creative, you're either in strategy, you're either in management, right? But then there is this frequent occurrence, honestly, with the way the market is working, which is like those in-between people, right? Like you, like me, who are like, we have a fit on creativity, but we also kind of take a look at the business side of things, at the workflow side of things. So how do you explain that to your clients? Ah, so, I mean, I'm a, I'm, the side note to all of this is that I've, since I was little, I've always been like writing out the lyrics for songs that I like, you know, people have quotes and things I'm like, I, this song has this one line, it's going to help me explain. I can never use it to explain anything. But there is this, um, there's an album by Garland Jeffries that's called The King of In-Between. And I feel like The King of In-Between is the perfect example for everything because Garland Jeffries had been out of, you know, creating music for, I want to say, close to 20 years. And he comes back to this world where it's like, you know, what's going on? Um, and it's actually really well acclaimed and received. And that's my thing with marketing today and how to explain it to people today uh 15 years ago 20 years ago you walk into these roles and yes your account manager is the person that does one thing your creatives do one thing and when you start seeing digital even with creative teams they were siloed right you have the copywriter the designer and your digital person um but when social media comes in and you start seeing all of that change that starts to happen where brands don't just have a catalog online now you have a voice um and it's not a voice just for your campaign or just for that one moment it's an always on voice you kind of need a different skill set from everybody, right? Because all of a sudden the account manager needs to know about that, but you need to think about the strategy and how it comes in and leverages um, different trends in real time. And so all of these people that had very specific roles can't have that specific role anymore. You kind of have to be flexible to jump into everybody's place. So I like to explain it like, you know, you jump out for a while, you jump back in and that doesn't mean that you're always active in marketing or you're not active in marketing, but like, things have changed in the way that brands communicate with their customers um, and in the way that we communicate with ourselves on a daily, in any case. And what do you say is that major change that you're noticing in the way brands communicate? I think the major change is that you can't time it anymore. That always on isn't like an aspiring strategy. It's the baseline of where you're at. Um, and that means that you have to be authentic right? Because if you're always on, you don't want to be playing a role that you're not. Um, and that authentic is something that you have to think about. Because you know that you want to hit, you know, your your sales goals, you know, you know that you have growth, you know that you're trying to change behaviors, but how do you do it along the way where like people really bond with what you're saying, and with the value that you bring them? 
I know from your experience that you've worked with tons of startups, startups, right? Doing yeah. this kind yeah. of work, helping them define their story. Now, my question is, and it's a frequent challenge that I notice when I start talking to folks and we want to explore, you know, their challenges and what they're looking to do, you know, the why as to what they're doing things. And many times it's like, well, we hear TikTok is kind of big right now, you know, and yeah. like, can we do a dance, go viral? And that will help us sell our software as a service. Yeah. So I'm sure you do a lot of work of educating the client on how to actually bring the impact. So if you could share a little bit of that about your experience and what are the frequent challenges you find when doing so? Yeah, I think... It's a challenge, but if you pose it the right way, people will actually be open to discussing it with you. So there's a lot, think about, you know, you open your LinkedIn, you open your email. There's a lot of people that are just selling goods and services all the time, right? Like, did you know that you need to have a newsletter? Did you know? I don't ever go about it as like, this is the shiny thing that you have to have. Um, I remember when I was in the shift of, of, you know, online catalog to content, my boss was very clever when he came up with this slide at the time. It was said, you know, viral is a disease. You don't go viral. <laughs> this is not, there's no formula for viral. Viral is something that just like spreads. Um, and so what you, and there was like a chart. It was super smart. It was like, you know, the, a virus has a peak and it goes down. Um, and we saw that with YouTube then, you know, afterwards where it's like, yeah, you have a peak and then it goes down. You don't want to peak and disappear. You want to keep going. And so... That's where I like to like bring in the conversations where it's it's not like you need you need or you needed to be on the Facebook scenes or the TikToks um, and then the chatbot and then how you need to integrate. No, it's like you need to learn what these things are, um, and in having a space uh, a space that's like safe for conversation of like yeah we didn't know that or we kind of knew it but we haven't thought about how to apply it. Um, then you just open up the gates for a conversation and a brainstorm of like, how do you best leverage these tools? So it's educating your customer to be able to educate their customers, right? Rather than just like showing up on a list. Um, and I think that's that's my my approach most of the time. Like, let's start with a workshop and and uh, a whiteboard and things like that. Have you found the clients are responsive? Then it's. I mean, I it's always you're betting against time, right? So if somebody just like has this order and they have to come in and like, you know, somebody up top told me that we needed to have the TikTok. It's going to take a little bit longer. It might not work that round. But I feel like the longer lasting relationships are the ones where people come in and like, oh, you know what? Let me bring in somebody else from my team. Let's talk about that. Or actually, let me bring this back because I had I was only thinking of this specific moment in time, but we can turn this into something bigger. Um, and once they sit down, like if you get people to sit down and, you know, we're talking pre-COVID, post-COVID, so it might be online, but just get get some time to scribble stuff together. That's where you see the entire difference. All right. So you, like, let's let's go to this scenario, right? Like you have had this conversation, you did the, the workshop, everybody agrees on the direction, you know, what are the objectives, KPIs, life's beautiful. Everybody's yeah. aligned, right? So it's time to build the team. And, um, you know, I know about that, that skill you have, I've been privileged enough to be in teams you built and met very talented people through that. So I want you to walk me through the secret sauce. What are you looking for when you're building these teams? What are the skills that will get you to pay attention to a specific creative profile or the kind of people that you are got? You know, besides making sure they actually have the right of an experience, right? <laughs> but like, how do you decide, okay, this is going to be a good fit for my team? That's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, you always have that gut check of like, there's something that just comes across right off the bat. But there's, it's a combination of, yes, your skill set. And for sure, show me your skill set. But it's the the balance of I versus we. And I do it really wrong for myself sometimes as well, where it's like, yeah, we did, we did, but were you leading? Yes, I was. Um, so I think it's like getting people to the point in a conversation where they can acknowledge their work in a team, their work in leadership, and where they'd like to be, right? Because there's a lot of 
uh, and think about it again, just like you're filling out a profile or whatever on LinkedIn to apply for a job. Um, there's a lot of, you know, you, you can't say that, you know, you're not uh, a team player, but you can't also just like not talk about your leadership. It kind of comes through in the way that you talk, right? Um, I personally value and, and because of my condition, you know, everybody who's speaking a second language, I think there's a lot to be said there. Um, there's just the value of you understanding multiple cultures, right? And so being able to adapt to that is a big, big thing to me. Um, and that adaptability, I mean, that's one big flag where I'm like, that completely comes across. If you're working in a different language, you already understand um, that it's not your playground and that you have to play by different rules. Um, but also people who just propose things like it's good that you can check off the list, but can you propose and can you brainstorm? Um, and I think that's a space where I really like to not just like in the hiring process, but in building and developing a team, I like to be very mindful of you came with a skill set, but you came with a set of ideas of what you wanted to do too. So how can I help you build that space? How can I give you that space? And you mentioned multicultural, which is a word, I think, back in 2014, back in 2015. You know how we like, for every year, we have a boss, right? Things. Like yep. 2020 <laughs> was crypto everything. 2021, I can't remember because it's sort of like the same year. 2022, it was all about the metaverse. You know, let's sell our house and buy yep. like a farm <laughs> on like the metaverse. 2023 and 2024, now it's all about AI revolutionizing everything, right? But let's, okay. let's go back in time, you know, because you do bring an aspect that to me has always been like kind of like the baseline to everything I do, which is, you know, the world has gotten in a way a lot smaller. Now we have communication, you know, we're all kind of like, at least in Occident, absorbing the same sort of culture. So there's a lot where we can find more similarities like that, let's say, 20 years ago, right? So, yeah. and you're definitely an expert on building this multicultural teams. What else can you notice as a benefit of this multicultural aspect of a team? Um so the thing about the multicultural for me is I was like confronted with it two ways. Uh, one, when I moved from Colombia to the U S and I'm, I, you know, I've, I've always been like, Oh yeah, I speak fluently in English. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Not really, <laughs> not really. And it really depends on what side of the U S you're at and what type of industry you want to work in. So you speak a baseline English language, but then you have to kind of build in from there. So, I definitely appreciate people who have been in different industries, who speak different languages, who, I mean, have, you know, even seen just like the differences of how industries evolve at one country to the next. I feel like um, it was across the board where, you know, Latin America was like we were a year, two years behind in the things that were going on. And so being able to see and really understand what was going on um, was in the U.S. was something that was just inspiring to us. Um I learned from someone in the earlier days in advertising that it was very different to take on a trend than to understand the DNA of why the trend was happening. Um, and that's the thing with people who are multicultural, right? Like you, you understand the DNA of what makes tick one place versus another and why there might be, you know, more, um, more embracement of one thing or another. Um, and so when you think about it that way, the second round for me was when we started working with the YouTube team where it was like, okay, we have this beautiful curriculum and base of things that we want brands and agencies to understand and creators to understand. Um, and so I remember we, you know, we signed off on that first curriculum, like we're ready to go, let's go. We went to Latin America and everybody was like, this is awesome. I want to be a certified YouTube brand strategist. Um, and we had to do multiple days of sessions. So it was great. And then we came back to do this exact session, I kid you not, um, in New York. And nobody showed up. And there was, you know, like 10 people, 15 people. We were supposed to get 25 to 30. Where is everyone? But you're sitting in a place where, like, it all happened a while ago. We don't have to be here, right? Um, or we would have activities uh, where you had to raise your hand and stand up. And just, don't do that in, like, in Japan, everybody would be looking at you like, I have to raise my, what? I don't want to raise my hand and like talk in front of other, I'm just listening to you and taking notes. That's the way it's done. Um, and so that was like the first round of, of, oh, it's different, but it's not like 
language is different and you can translate and be done. It's like you have to change the experience. And so we had to build out these teams, right? But you were always looking for a baseline, again, of things that people knew. So yeah, okay, let's all be able to speak in English for sure. Let's all be able to understand marketing for sure. But can you deliver and like connect with people in that way? Is it a simple way of explaining? Um, you know, I have, I have friends and family who are teachers and they're like very offended by the idea that anybody can teach and they're right. Not everybody can teach, um, but you can, you can open the space to teach what you know how to do. If you understand that, that sort of cultural surrounding and the people that are with you, um, and it doesn't really take big terms or big anything. It just like takes people who understand the story that they want to tell. I think that's one of the most important parts, right? When folks like you and I are educating possible clients, it's just reinforcing the impact of the human element. And that's something we talk about a lot in this pocket, which is obviously we have all embrace Gen AI and we're going to go into that in a minute. But there's such an importance still and I think many companies will be finding out that you still need that human element, right? If you rely on AI for everything, you're just going to get very generic and just frankly trash outputs, right? So I think that's where the multicultural team, it's for me at least, is back on the spot. Like, you know, and it's more crucial than ever. And obviously, there's economic factor, right? Like it's not the same to hire someone in the U.S., which folks should absolutely still hire creatives in the U.S., like Nat and I. But, <laughs> you know, it's also sometimes it is a fact that budgets have been getting smaller with the current state of the economy in 2024. So they do have also this upside of they can be competitive, right? And personally, I still believe creatives should be paid their worth. So I'm not talking, you know, pay $5 for a full day of work, like you'll see in some platforms, but it can be competitive. The differences are real, and especially for you and I who come from Latin America, we do know there's very talented people there that can definitely bring this different difference. And also because we're experienced on economic crisis, right? Like we were yeah. born with inflation. I can definitely vote for that as an Argentine, as Argentinian. You know, we know crazy economy. We know how to have a plan A, B, C, D, E, and be like, okay, we're going to need F because I'm not sure E is going to cover everything. So I think there's something to say about the value of multicultural beyond the bottom line of, okay, my spreadsheet says if I hire five in California, it's going to cost this versus, you know, one in Spain, one in Argentina, one in Jakarta, and just one in maybe like Oklahoma to be customer facing. I do want to go into the AI factor right now that we're yeah. into that. And how have you noticed AI changing the way you work in let's say the last year? So let me touch on something that you just mentioned because I think it's important, which is that cultural component and being competitive in international rates also helps and paired with AI just helps you kind of like level everybody up. I think you do get a lot from people who are working uh, in other countries that want to have the chance to work within the U.S. Um, and I also think that just giving that chance also like you have to understand that it's a double thing or I always see it that way. It's like it's competitive in terms of the rates that you're going to give your clients you can maintain the quality, but you're also giving this other subset of people the opportunity to have an experience and to have on their resumes and their, you know, sort of portfolio of work, something that they wouldn't be exposed to on a daily. Um, and I think AI works, I'll segue into that because it works really well in the sense of like, it's given everybody again, a base tool to be able to to speak to how to create this content, right? So again, it's not just that you're bilingual. It's not just that you're translating. How do you pick up on the nuances for things? How do you scan the news faster, right? Because you, you've got all the tabs, all of the search, but how can you bring in the most relevant things? Um, I I work with someone who's like a, the chat GPT genius and she has all of these add-ons to bring in. So like bring me news that are focused on the, you know, the positive sense, but also never touch on these things, but also, you know, and so it's like, how do you use the tools to really refine the search that you're doing? 
and help you find your own brand voice and help you find that own base so that you can bring the ideas that you have from where and from your, you know, your base and your creativity and your background, and you can bring them faster to life. Um, and so I think it's, it's not over, not overusing any of these tools. If anything, I'd like, we, we keep the teams and the people that I'm working with, it's like, you should have this sheet. And I keep saving all of these documents, all of these posts that I see on LinkedIn, like what to never use, not keen, not, I hope this finds you well, not the, but, and, ors like, you, you know, just like, it's a good first pass. Now give it yourself on top of that. In the ever changing landscape or the yes, word the delve. <laughs> delve. Skyrocket. Would you even, and, and I feel like, and perhaps this is, this is off brand, but if you, if you're in a casual, if you're in a casual office conversation, would you use these terms is my first thing, like filter that out. And then if you feel like you would have a hard time, and this goes for me, I hate the word, the word rural because I can never get it right. But like, you'll use it in conversation. Rural. <laughs> rural. Um, but like, would you use Dell? Would you say, oh, I'm keen to find out. I, I don't know. So like, you know, it, it helps you craft and draft something quickly. It also helps you write your own and go through like a Grammarly or do, you know, a Jasper check or do the way a thesaurus would. Um, it, it just helps kind of standardize that you don't have the commas, the periods, the spacing, the whatever wrong, um, and can help enhance vocabulary and language. But the real layer that I'm looking for is you, right? Like, what was your thought process here? It's so crazy how we can have parallel experiences, right? I've been using nope. Grammarly, I think, I mean, I don't know how long they've been around, but pretty much since the beginning, because obviously as a non-native speaker, Sometimes we might feel very comfortable speaking, but we still don't get the grammar right, or there are certain rules that might be different, you know, like uh, having the dot within the apostrophes versus outside for me was like, what do you mean? You know, and it was just, <laughs> <laughs> it's starting to live in the US. Uh, but definitely through Grammarly, one thing, and they're not paying me to say these, they actually charge yeah. me the memory, <laughs> but like, so Grammarly, if you want to sponsor me. That's fine. I agree. Uh, but, you know, it's it's been very helpful for me as a non-native speaker to improve the way I speak, my grammar, how confident I can feel speaking, right? So that's been definitely a tool that has been super helpful for me. Uh, but with ChatGPT, it's crazy because obviously it's great for a lot of things, but I've been noticing that as time goes by, while I, while I still use it, I won't lie, I use it a lot for brainstorming. I don't use it as much for anything that is going to end up being public facing because what I'm noticing, and I know it's not just me, is that it's the more we are exposed to it, the more people, especially folks like us that work on the industry, that see this every day, you know, and our eyes and brains are kind of trained to detect patterns and stuff. It's like you can tell right away when something was written with AI from how it starts to how it finishes, that it's always kind of like this same formula that it uses. So I think in that sense, you know, what the value we can bring, it's kind of like, okay, let's use that as a tool. But again, if you want to create results that go beyond the, that race to the bottom of let's just cut costs, do everything with AI and do it totally forgettable, let's use it we would use any other tool, right? As a calculator, as Grammarly, and sure. Yeah. It has a lot of value on improving workflow speed. I use it a lot. One thing that I actually learned on the first episode of this podcast, talking to Jim Conley, which who I know you know, and he has this great technique that he was sharing, which he's like, I'll just like turn on the microphone on Google Docs. I just start talking. So if I'm like, I have writer's block, I'll just start talking, right? And um, once I don't, I just ran through ChatGPT and I'm like, please try to organize my thoughts. I think that's a brilliant use of ChatGPT. Listen, I heard the podcast and when I did, I was like opening it on my phone. Like, okay, how do I do this now? And I, that is literally the way that I'm doing work this week. Um, Cause I think it's absolutely true. There's, there's a lot of writer's block. And I think again, going to the multicultural, you're like, okay, so where does, is this coming across as the right thing? Um, you, you said it at the beginning, but like, what does it mean to build brand? And so for me, that's like, are you, is this coming across as like, I'm a graphic designer or I'm going to, you know, like be boxed into one thing. Um, and when you talk about it 
and then you have like that bring out the succinct, the succinct points for me like that's a very objective tool to give you a final product but you've been doing the whole thing yourself um I would say that the pairing to all of this is that the more that I use these AI tools, the more that I feel like I need to walk outside and see what people are doing on the street. Um, and that's maybe that's a little old school too, but I think that's part of um, and part of the struggle of like having having hybrid teams, having remote teams. And I don't get me wrong, I work from home. I really I, like I am the poster person for the whole thing. But how do you? create that connection and how do you walk out and make sure that it makes sense um i'm going to date myself very much but before we even had phones uh you know my my dad worked in real estate and he said that everything that he needed to know he would know uh by walking around an area for two three hours different times of day different days of the week um and i feel like that's very true like you you forget about it. I was asked to do that for a project. We're like, hey, you have to go out and see all of these supermarkets. I'm like, I don't have to go out to see supermarkets anymore. I can pull the information. Um, and day three, visiting supermarkets, I was like, I need to do this for myself across the board, everywhere, not just supermarkets. Like I need to refresh seeing these things so that you you bring that information and you use the tool to kind of like just trickle it down for you. But you're not getting all of your information from a tool in AI. We also got to keep in mind, right, it's us humans, we're unpredictable in a yeah. way. <laughs> ChatGPT might sound like super specific or accurate about things, but at the end of the day, if we're all using the same tool, everything's going to sound the same, right? I always talk when I work with people about what ingredient we bring to the soup, right? What's going to make this soup different? And I can tell from, you know, again, I was born in Argentina, so football it's very important for me. Um, and I bring that. I bring those experiences of going to the stadium, you know, every other Sunday to go root for my team. Uh, the fact that maybe uh, as a teenager, because of the economy, we didn't have that many resources, so we had to become resourceful. I wouldn't even think about that because it was our normal, right? So I'm not like, oh, yeah. for me, I need to be resourceful. It's just like, okay, doesn't work. Let's try something else, which I think, it's ultimately what can differentiate, you know, how do you solve problems? Uh, what are the elements you're bringing into what I call, you know, kind of like your, I don't know if it's palette, you know, where the painters are yeah. painting palettes, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. I think in my artistic or creative palette, I have a lot of ingredients that have nothing to do with what Ford's say or what ChatGPT says or what the manuals say, but it's kind of like story. It's like, walking the streets, talking to people, developing those people skills, because at the end of the day, you're still talking to folks and you never know where things are going to go next. Right right now, even like the 2000s are coming back. I see kids wearing all those. And I'm, it's these days, right? I'm aging Don't myself me now <laughs> because back in the day, I remember wearing those like jeans that were like four people would fit into them, right? And they would like, we'd get all this up. And now you see kids going back to that I, what i felt was the most terrible time on earth <laughs> which was the early 2000s bad music bad clothes uh again uh and kids are going for that so you never know i think um and walking the streets and keeping your eyes on the pulse of what folks humans are actually doing it, i think it's fundamental for differentiation i think so and i think it's exciting because I feel like in the early 2000s, if you traveled abroad, there was so much serial. I mean, don't even get me started with Colombia, but like all of these stereotypes that you were fighting consistently. And then you're in a space right now where globally, it's very generous that there's lots of people that have turned around to look and see. And like, I, I love the whole, oh, can you tell me a little bit about Colombia? Oh, I've heard about this city. I've heard about this whole, and it's great. And you can talk about your country in a way that you've never talked about in your country before, right? And you can leverage these things and people are open to it. But it's also great that as like the adults that we are, <laughs> you can take all of this background of how you grew up and translate it into what makes you a unique and special person for a team today. So yes, we are scrappy because we never got the big budgets that everybody else had. We had to adapt to Latin America. And even then we were adapting behind the line for everybody else. Um, but that means that we knew how to produce video that was, you know, less expensive. We knew how to come up with images. We knew how to work our way with 
uh, you know, not having to deal with uh, issues in terms of replicating or but rather, rather creating original. Um, and I think that original is, is much more celebrated in the world today is like something unique you can bring to the table. Um, so yes, all of the big genes, but probably something different that's filling them in. <laughs> <laughs> Kids is safe, right? That want to go into marketing. And they're facing shrinking budgets, generative AI, you know, and folks may be thinking that it's the end all solution to everything. How do you see marketing and brand building changing, let's say within the next five years? What's your theory? So I'll try to, I've been reading a lot about storytelling, making a comeback, which is something that's super exciting to me because I feel like, uh, and you know, you touched on at the beginning when we do uh, pitch decks and things like that for Boston University. It's like, there's a formula, right? You need to present these things and this will make you successful. This will get you to the rounds of funds and you're done. And But the ultimate thing that drives these companies and other organizations is the storytelling. And so I like to think that's where I would like to position myself in the world of marketing, where I hope there's a future for you know everybody who, who has that ability to tell a story. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean like if there's a limited amount. You have everybody has an ability to tell a story from a different background. Um, whether you're in finance and you can read through the numbers and you know come into it, or whether you're in the creative space and you just know how to build a story that can really grip someone from for the first three seconds. I think for me, that future of market of marketing is in the storytelling, but it's not that grand scheme and the like big story. It's the the genuine and scrappy. Because the genuine and scrappy is where you're at, you're at on a daily basis. And so it doesn't matter if you have to cut back on your budget or if you're growing and you're crazy good. You just have this voice for yourself, right? And so when you're posting on social media, like we, we talked about it a lot in the early days of the Creator Academy. Like when somebody sees that little button go up on the subscribe and they're like, yeah, I want to see you every Thursday and every, you know, every Tuesday, every Thursday. Why are they doing that? Like, what is it about your voice that's reassuring or the things that you're talking about or, you know, that like, it just makes you connect. And so I feel like that's the thing with marketing where like, it doesn't matter how much money you have in that budget. If you know how to tell the story and you can be scrappy about it, so long as you're genuine with the story, that's where it is. And that'll translate into everything. If you think about it into like email marketing, I want to say seven years ago, the big thing was that you had the seven email sequence, right? So first you introduce yourself and then email number five, nobody's replied. So you send like a joke, but you're also saying goodbye. And then email seven is the breakup. And, and the more that you fall into that method, the less authentic that you feel. I got an email a couple of days ago where it was like, hey, I fumbled on a call that we had with you. We weren't really prepared. Here are three things that we think that we can offer you. You fumbled on a call with me? Like, okay, you had me right there. What is it that you need to say? There were no resources there. That's pure brain power. You're thinking of how to talk to me. If you're sending that out to other people, that's fine. But like you made it feel authentic right there. Um, and so, yeah, scrappy and genuine is the thing for me. And that is that should be bulletproof for any budget. One final question I want to ask you, right? In Critique and Robots, basically... The why as to why I started this podcast was because I've been privileged enough to work and continue working with a lot of passionate creatives, right? From whom I learn every day, all the time. And one thing that it's huge for me that I always try to find out when I talk to folks, it's like, why are you still passionate about this? What drives you? I like figuring people out. And I feel like, that's the story, really. Like, what's going on inside this team? What's going on inside of this startup? What about this huge organization that needs to rebrand? You know, like, what what is it that's going on uh, that we need to tell to the outside? Or what is it that's going on on the outside that you need to hear on the inside? Because I think that's the other thing. Um, I, you know, there's always this division of B to C, B to B, but like, people are people and the more that you work with anybody who's touched brand they all start out with that people are people so i really just like figuring things out like if somebody's standing again to the grocery store they're standing there they're going to grab a product can you understand 
what made them take it there and like what's the conversation that's going on around it and like this is the world happening around you um and i just i i like watching that and i and i love being able to come back and like oh you know what i saw the other day that's like this very did you notice that your clients do this thing um and i'm lucky enough that nine out of ten of the times people are like i did not notice that what is how did you see that <laughs> so i think it's like a cultivated thing that i've done but i just being able to tell, you know, from the outside in or from the inside out, that story of something that like, you need to do something about this. I love that story. That's so awesome. Natalia Ragori, brand and team builder, a curious person, kick is leader. How can prospective clients, companies, startups find you? Where do they learn more about you and your work? Um, I think you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the, the right place to go and I'm happy to connect there. Awesome. We'll be adding the link to the description. We'll also have a QR somewhere here on the screen for those of you watching the video. For those of you listening to the podcast, you'll have her name on the title. So if you can click on the link, which I know happens for folks on Spotify, you can go ahead and look for her on LinkedIn. I strongly advise you to do so because there's a lot to learn from Natalia. So Natalia, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we hope you have an amazing day. And we, I, I have enjoyed this conversation a lot. So I really appreciate you coming in to chat with me for a few minutes. Thank you, Juan. I appreciate it. It's been very exciting to see you again. <laughs> <laughs>